Well, good morning. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter, chapter 2. Uh, we as Christians, we, we gather every Sunday for the purpose of, of worship, uh, worship of, of Jesus Christ, the worship of our Savior, worship uh, in, through which we express our honor of God, our express our thanks to Him. We pay homage really to the Lord our God because we as Christians gather traditionally on a Sunday uh, because we have heard of Christ. We have, we have come to believe who He is and what He has done. We have found a great treasure, a pearl of great price, and we have sold our stake in the world to secure what is precious in heaven. Uh, it's like the words of Jim Elliot said that we have given up what we cannot keep to gain what we cannot lose. And so that's why we, we are here. Uh, and that is the appropriate response when we come to know who Jesus Christ is, when we come to know him to be the Messiah, uh, the, the Christ, uh, the King, son of David, son of Abraham. When we've come to know him as the Savior, the one sent by God to save his people from their sin. If we've come to know him as the Son of God, God incarnate, God the Son. And we, we, we normally would, would cover this passage around Christmas time. And, and in Christmas time, we have carols, Christmas carols, which actually are filled with great theology. I'm just thinking of, of the song of, of Charles Wesley, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. There's one line that he says there, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. That's how we should how should we sing that. It is when you look at Jesus, we see God. We see the Godhead. Uh, Hail the incarnate deity. Please as man with men to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. And uh, Wesley was, was trying to, to communicate to us that if you want to know what God is like, then know Jesus. You want to know who God is, then get to know Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Matthew, starting in his gospel, he wanted us to know who Christ is. And so last week we saw that he presented, well, not only last week, the, uh, the week before that, we, we saw that he presented uh, Jesus as the King, as the Christ, the Messiah, the one who was born of David, uh, the one who was born of Abraham, and also that this Jesus is the one who will come to save his people from uh, their sin, and who, will, who is God incarnate, God Emmanuel. And this week going on, we see in chapter 2, the first 12 verses, which will be our text this morning, really there are different responses to this Jesus, to this King, to the Lord God. Uh, and really we can summarize that into three words, which is adoration, animosity or apathy. One of those three are typical responses to the identity of Jesus Christ. Uh, characteristic responses that is, we've seen throughout the ages when the identity of Jesus becomes known to people. So let us read Matthew chapter 2, the first 12 verses before we continue. Matthew 2 verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, to Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." 
Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I, so that I too may come and worship him. And after hearing the king, they went their way, and the, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell on the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for uh, revealing Christ to us through your scriptures. We thank you for the gospel of Matthew and all that it will teach us about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, even this morning as we look at this passage and we see uh, different characters responding differently to the identity of Christ. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word, that you would um, encourage us, Lord, in the areas where we are weak, that you would admonish us when we are in need of correction, Lord, and that you would train us, Lord, in righteousness, Lord, to continue on doing what is right in the eyes of, of the Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so first of all, we, 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 I want to look at, at adoration, the, the, the first response, really worship. Now, at the birth of Jesus, Luke, of course, gives us a fuller explanation. Matthew sort of jumps uh, from, from, uh, from uh, the story of Joseph and, and, and Mary. Luke actually gives us the account of, of the shepherds that was in the field when suddenly an angel appeared to him, uh, declaring to them that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and, and the, the, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they, of course, packed up and immediately went to Bethlehem and found the baby in the manger and, and bowed down and worshipped him, leaving, of course, there, and I'm sure telling everybody that they could find that the Messiah was born. Then Luke goes on and he tells us about Jesus being presented in Jerusalem. You have to remember, Bethlehem was just about 10 kilometers away from, from Jerusalem, so they went there and, and went back to Bethlehem. But then Luke actually moves forward, and he, the next section in Luke talks about them being going up to, to Nazareth. But here in Matthew, we find here that at this time, now after Jesus was born, after that, born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of, of Herod, uh, that could be no longer, no more than, than two years later, uh, but it was definitely not immediately after the birth of, of Christ. And we see this from a number of indications in the passage where in verses 8 and 9, he's no longer called an infant, but a child. It's a different Greek word that is used there. So Jesus is a little bit older by now, and they are no longer in the manger when the Magi appear. So in spite of what all the Christmas cards tell you, they were now living in a house. Uh, they've, they've moved out of the manger. They're now in the house when, when, the, when the Magi uh, appeared to them. And also, according to calculations from, from Herod, we'll see later on that Jesus was estimated to be no older than two years old, but no longer an, an, an infant. Uh, and so we find in, in Matthew's Gospel that there's these men, Magi from the East, that has arrived in Jerusalem. And so who were these people? Who were the Magi, uh, the wise men from the East? Now, throughout through church history, there's been a lot of speculation about the identity of, of the Magi. Some say that they were, they were kings. Uh, some say they were kings from different nations. 
that came to, to pay homage to Christ. Others say that you'll see this depicted in pictures of it, that sometimes they are different ages, and so they would say they are representative of different ages, uh, so that all men would come and, uh, of course, read a lot into, into the text there. Uh, and then others were saying that they were representatives of the sons of Noah, that they were from the three sons of Noah, that these were descendants from the sons of Noah, and some have gone as far as to name them, Gaspar and Melchior and Balthazar. Uh, of course, they all conclude that there were only three based on the gifts that were given, but there is no indication of how many there were, they were most likely more than, than just three. But... Uh, more accurately, I would think uh, there was a historian, Herodotus, a Greek historian living in the 5th century before Christ, and he identified the Magi as a Median tribe, uh, a tribe from Media, and who really served in the royal courts of the Medians and the Persians, uh, with a history going back to the 7th century B.C., and so these men were, were really wise men. They were, they were well-versed in, in natural sciences uh, as well as astronomy and astrology. Uh, in those days, that two disciplines were much closer together. Uh, and so they served at, as advisors to, 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 the, to the royal courts, to diviners, to magicians, to priests, really to the, to the Medians and the, and the Persians. Uh, we actually read that uh, mentioned in the book of Daniel. We remember Daniel when King Nebuchadnezzar at the command that the, the wise men should interpret, both tell him his dream and interpret them. Uh, none could do that. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, the reasonable man that he was, was going to kill them all. Uh, uh, but uh, Daniel interceded for them and by God's grace was given the, both the, the, the dream and the interpretation. And so Daniel was made the prefect over all the wise men of, of, of Babylon. And we read that in Babylon 2. And so the Magi was, was really, they, they, were, they were men of, of, of quite prominent Prominence. They were, they, were, they were wise men. They were, they were kingly advisors. And, and so these ma the Magi, three perhaps, uh, more likely many more, because uh, to travel in those days uh, with valuables at all, you needed probably guards and, and some servants if these were notable men. And, and so they came from the east. Um, the East can be anywhere. It can, can be Arabia. It, uh, most likely it's from, from, from uh, uh, Persia, which is modern-day Iran, or from Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. And so they would journey from there to come and find the one born king of the Jews. And so they arrived in Jerusalem and asking questions. They wanted to pay homage. They want to worship um, the Lord. And I mean, I, this is actually quite extraordinary when you think about it, that uh, really from Babylon to Jerusalem is about 800 miles that they have traveled with, most likely with camels and, and other animals, uh, just because they saw a star. They saw his star in the east. So the question is, if, if there was a lot of speculation about who the Magi was, the star is even more. So they were, they were obviously, those who, who suggest that, that the star was a, uh, really a, a natural phenomena, that it was a celestial, not a celestial, an astral body, uh, uh, with, with the knowledge of the Magi, of, of astronomy and astrology. Some say it was Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, was the biggest planet in, the, in, the, in our solar system, uh, and who represented really all the Babylonian empire. And then Saturn came into close contact with that in the constellation of Pisces, and, and, uh, and the, the Saturn represented... Uh, uh, the, the, the Jews and... and uh, Pisces represented the Palestine, and so they deducted that it must be in Jerusalem where, uh, where, the, where the king was going to be born. Others say, no, no, that's, the way, that's unlikely. It's probably a, a comet or an, or an asteroid that they saw flying through the sky, and they, they interpret that uh, as, as, as a sign that the king would be born. As, now, 
I find that very unusual. I find it actually quite bizarre that you would look up in the sky and see maybe something new that you haven't seen before and say, oh yes, that must be Jesus, King of the Jews. When you had no background, when you, these are pagan uh, uh, people. And so myself together with others, and though I'm not dogmatic about it, I think this is a supernatural phenomenon. This was, this was a, a light that appeared in the sky, and it could be an angel, it could be the glory of the Lord appearing in the sky, and I think that it must have been accompanied by revelation to give understanding of what this sign means, uh, revelation or illumination from God uh, as to the meaning of this star. Uh, I, as I sort of lean towards, and I'm not dogmatic, so I don't, if, don't hold me or crucify me for it, but I, I believe that it, um, it was most likely a manifestation of the glory of God. Throughout Scripture, we read much of the glory of God presenting itself as a, as a light. Uh, we read, of course, in, in, uh, with the Exodus, that there was a pillar of fire, a pillar of light that le led uh, the Israelites out of, uh, or during, during their wanderings in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, and God came down in a consuming fire, which I would, would suppose is, would be very bright. Moses' face shone really brightly after being in the presence of God. Jesus, when uh, he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfigures, his face, it says, shone like the sun. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he was uh, brought to his knees by the Lord, saw a light flash brighter than the noonday sun. Uh, of course, John, uh, who saw the ascended Lord in, in Revelation, said that his face was shining like, like the sun. And, and one day the heavenly Jerusalem would be, no, have no need of a moon or a star because the glory of God will be its light. I think closer in context, of course, is what happened to the, to the, to the shepherds when, when um, the, it was announced by the angel that uh, Christ was born, that the glory of the Lord shone around them. And so I, I, I understand this, that it was uh, a supernatural light, uh, the glory of the God manifesting itself to these men, uh, together with obviously some illumination or some revelation as to the meaning of it. Uh, of course, there is, it's possible that when Daniel was chief prefect over the, the, the wise men, that he probably taught them from the scriptures, I would imagine, uh, the wisdom of God from the scriptures, and that they may have heard of Balaam's prophecy. Balaam prophesied uh, uh, in, in Numbers 24, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. So they may have heard that and uh, with this light shining up as a star, may have interpreted it as this is what it means. Uh, even, even as it is, I think they still needed some help there to, to make those, those connections. Uh, so this unusual star appeared the, to the Magi in their country in the east, and so they've interpreted it to be the star of the one born king of the Jews. Uh, and they were convinced enough that's what we have to remember. These, these people who saw the sign and were convinced that they need to go. They need to go and examine this. They need to act upon this. They need, and so they departed on this, this long journey to, to Jerusalem. Uh, and there, only to discover that nobody else seems to know that the king of the Jews was born. Uh, and so they ask around, and, and King Herod heard of them, and uh, he, of course, inquired from the chief priest, what is going on, when is the Messiah going to be born, and, they, and where, and they say, well, in Bethlehem of Judea, because there is a Bethlehem in Galilee as well, so, but this was Bethlehem in Judea, and so... Herod directed them to Bethlehem, and they continued their search, and on their way there, the star seems to reappear. So uh, we understand that the star appeared to them back in the east, and then was no longer visible. And so they assumed by the, 
the interpretation of what they experienced, that they need to go, well, this is the king of the Jews, so let's go to the capital, to Jerusalem, and find out, hey, where is this king born, king of the Jews? Uh, and, of course, that is where they directed. And so as they were going ba- on to, Babel, uh, to, to Bethlehem, the star appears again. And when they saw the star, we read that they, were, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Uh, this, this is amazing. This is just pagan people that respond with such jubilation at, at, the, at the revelation of his star. And, and this star was then moving right to the place where Christ was born, right over the house. And therefore, I think it has to be a f- supernatural phenomenon because I don't know of any star that does or would, would do that or can even do that. Um, and so I suppose you need as much faith to believe it was a supernatural phenomenon as it was a star that did that. Uh, but the extraordinary thing is that these men, men acted. They, the little revelation, the little, little knowledge that they had moved them. It prompted them. It persuaded them to pack up and move, say, 800 miles to another country through difficult and dangerous terrain uh, at great expense to themselves, bringing valuables with them to bow down to a foreign king of a conquered people who were not aware of his existence. It's extraordinary. And really, I see the fingerprints of God all over these events uh, where they came and they bowed down before Christ, the child, worshiping him, showing him honor, adoration, paying him homage. And then, of course, they brought gifts. Gold, gold was, was very valuable then, back then, as it is, is today, and really the, the currency of kings, I suppose. Uh, the frankincense was, was an aromatic resin, also very valuable, that gave off a very sweet perfume when, when burned. And it really, it was the only, only uh, uh, incense that was permitted on the altar for the, for the Jewish people. They were, they were, some of their offerings, they were to sprinkle frankincense or put frankincense on there, which was really representing of, a, of an acceptable life uh, uh, to, to God. And then, of course, myrrh. Myrrh was a mixture of, of a resin and, and oil, myrrh oil, and it was used to perfume clothing. Uh, it was also used, of course, in burials. We remember that when, when, uh, when Jesus died, they brought uh, spices, and um, among which myrrh, to, to wrap him. Uh, of course, it also had some medicinal qualities, um, some pain-relieving qualities, because they gave Jesus myrrh, uh, or water mixed with myrrh on the cross to, to, to alleviate uh, the pain. But, but all three of those items were very valuable in those days, and, and they came and they paid homage, they, they worship, they expressed their worship to the child through these, these gifts. And they had very little knowledge really, if you think about that. Yet they responded with a wholehearted devotion. They responded in faith, believing that it was true. What they have heard, what they have seen, what they have discovered, they believed. And so they responded in a sincere and genuine adoration. Worship, bowing down, bringing gifts. And, of course, we see that they responded really in obedience uh, to the revelation that they received. First, back in Babylon, that moved them to, to, to come to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. And then, afterwards, uh, through the dream that God warned them not to return to King Herod. And they obeyed. They responded in faith to the revelation that they received. And really, this is, this is how, this is the only acceptable or reasonable response that anyone should have 
at the identity, at coming to know the identity of Jesus Christ. Getting to know him for who he is. And so when, when, when you hear the truth about Christ, the heart of the true worshiper responds in faith. When you hear the gospel message of Jesus, the heart of a true worshiper will respond in faith. Even though you may not have all the answers, even though you do not understand, you have questions, faith trusts, faith believes, faith responds, faith yields, faith worships. And so the true, the heart of the true worshiper responds in faith and responds in adoration. Adoration at Jesus the King, Jesus the Savior, Jesus the, the Son of God. And so when, if we are true worshipers, then we are drawn by the truth, motivated or convict by, by our convictions, by our faith, and then nothing will stop us to worship Christ, not distance, not danger, not difficult day, not a distressing week, not disinterested people, not, not disappointing uh, reactions of others, not, not devious or deceitful people. Nothing will prevent a true worshiper from coming to worship Christ. I mean, we are, we are, in our day, are very, very fortunate to be able to come every week together to worship Christ. We come freely and unrestricted, safely and, and, and very comfortably, I would, have, I, would, I would say. And yet, it seems that for many in the church today, Worship, corporate worship, is secondary, is optional. Many in, in the church today have seemed to have forgotten that it's not about us, it's about Christ. It's not about what is in it for us. It is for Christ. It is not about the quality of the facilities, the ministries on offer for my children or, or not, the, 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 the structure of the service or the style of worship, or even the quality of the coffee and the bickies that we eat afterwards. It's about Christ. It's about Jesus. We come to Him. When we come here, it's to worship Him. It's to bow down before Him because that's the only proper response to the revelation of who He is. And we come, first of all, to give ourselves, to offer ourselves up to Him. When we bring our gifts, we first bring ourselves. You have to bring your heart first of all. Jesus said those who want to, want to save their lives will lose it, but those who lose their lives for Him and His sake, they will save it, will gain it. Romans tells us that in light of the mercies of God, that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, a living and holy, acceptable sacrifice to God, which is the only reasonable act of worship that there is in response to the light of the mercies that we have in Christ. So you bring yourself first and foremost. And then when you bring yourself and you consecrate your heart unto worship Christ, then all the rest of the stuff in your life will fall into place. Your relationships, your, your relationship with other people, your relationship with your, with your possessions and, and wealth and everything else will fall into place. Why? Because your heart is worshiping Christ. 
And you are moved by that to obedience, to do what He desires, to do, follow His will. I mean, this is what these wise men did. They, they, with the little revelation that they had, they obeyed. That to me is extraordinary. As I say, I, this, this is, must be a work of God in their lives, in their hearts. And so the same for us, when, when you come and you believe that Christ is who Scripture declares Him to be, then if you believe Him to be your Savior, let Him save you. Stop trying to save yourself. If you believe He is your Lord, then obey Him. Bow before Him. Do His will, not your own. And if you believe He is your God, then love Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Worship Him. And so, as I say, adoration is the only true and proper response to the revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ. That He is the Christ. He is the Savior. He is the God, the Son. However, as we find in this passage and throughout the ages, there are a different response, and that is this response of animosity. And King Herod really exemplifies this for us. This resp he responded with animosity, with hostility, with opposition, with really in persecution. And, and King Herod was is a, is really was called also uh, Herod the Great. Uh, he was an Edomian. He was not even a Jew. He was a descendant of Esau, not of Jacob. And he was made uh, the, the prefect of Galilee by his father, Herod Antipater. And so, who was, was given that, uh, gov uh, to govern that whole region, so he made his son prefect of Galilee. Galilee. And, and, and uh, Herod, uh, the King Herod here, was very successful in, in suppressing the rebellious groups, the, the Jewish zealots, uh, the Maccabees, you may, may have heard of them, but they were, there was all these little groups of Roman, Roman rule uh, at, the, at that time, but, but he was successful in, in, in suppressing that until the, the, the Parthians invaded um, Palestine at that time. The Parthians was, was, a, was, a, was an empire that started just really north of the old uh, Assyrian Empire. After the Assyrian Empire, we obviously had the, the Babylonian Empire, then the, then the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greek. And after the Greek Empire, that was divided into uh, the, the Seleucid Empire in the north and the Ptolemies in the south in Egypt. But the Parthians was just north of the Seleucid part, which is modern day Iran, Iraq, uh, but they became the dominant power at the time of just before Christ. And, and so they invaded Palestine and, and, and Herod had to flee. Uh, but he regrouped and with the help of Rome and he came back pronouncing himself as to be the king of the Jews. And he, after a two year fight with, with the Parthians, actually uh, defeated them and established his kingdom in Palestine. So Herod saw himself as the self-proclaimed king of the Jews. Uh, now this, 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 uh, this history with the Parthians, of course, is probably the reason why he was so nervous when the Magi arrived, uh, probably with no small entourage. Uh, and so he was a little bit uh, unsure because he was a self-proclaimed king of the Jews. Here they tell him there's one born king. Not that he will be made king or become king. He is born king of the Jews. And so Herod was not going to allow this group of foreigners and a homegrown king to threaten his authority and his rule. He was actually not notoriously paranoid uh, and ruthless when he uh, suspected any disloyalty. He actually had his, one of his wives killed and two of his sons because he suspected them of 
disloyalty, insurrection. And so that's probably why the rest of Jerusalem was also nervous when they saw these magi come in, because not that they saw them directly as a threat, but Herod will not be pleased, and uh, they may be on the short end of his wrath. Uh, but King Herod knew enough of Jewish history, knew enough of, 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 the, of the scriptures uh, to know that King of the Jews was a messianic title. And so he went to the, to, the, to the chief priest and the scribes and he says, okay, where will this king of the Jews be born? Where will he be from? And so they told him in Bethlehem of, of Judea and so he secretly summoned the Magi and sent them to find this king. Um, it's probably better that he could dispose of this king and sort of blame it on the, on the Magi or sort of pin it on them rather than he himself. But he was not motivated because he said he wanted to worship him as well, but he was not motivated by worship but by self-preservation, by murderous intent. And so we find here the the second response to the identity of Christ, and that is of animosity. Of course, there's the adoration uh, of, of, of the Magi, and here Herod represents really the, the hostility towards Christ, uh, hostile against the good news. Uh, and we see that kind of response in Herod, but also throughout ages where some responds to the good news of the kingdom with animosity, with hostility. Hostility towards Christ, hostility towards his, his people. And although they may disguise their intentions through a mask of piety, through a mask of uh, sophistication, uh, or, or just respectability, but underneath that mask pumps a heart full of hatred. Hatred towards God. Hatred towards his Christ, his gospel, his word, his people. Why? Because sinful man is God over his own life. Sinful man does not bow to other gods. Sinful man does not tolerate a rival ruler, another God, who would come and usurp his authority, question his autonomy, demand his submission. And so throughout the ages, we have seen people respond towards Christ, the knowledge of Christ, the gospel, the people of God, Christians, sin-hardened, unrepented men persecuted the prophets and the apostles. Hebrews 11 tells us that some of those believers had their properties confiscated. And they were opposed and harassed. They were mocked and scourged. They were chained and imprisoned. They were stoned to death and sawn in half. And since they cannot inflict their hatred on Christ personally, they now turn and focus their attention on those who call on his name. Really, the identity of Christ ultimately reveals the true identity, the true colors of each person. Will you bow before him in adoration, or will you resist him, oppose him, kill him, if you can, in your own life? But praise be to our Lord, who is immensely gracious and slow to anger. Because we've seen even in history that there were those who acted in that way, 
who ridiculed and mocked him. Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him, mocked him. But by God's grace, we read that they believed in him. They were forgiven. Saul, the Pharisee, persecuted Christ through going after his church until the Lord graciously, mercifully called him to himself and made him an apostle, a proclaimer of the gospel. And I was just, um, uh, again, struck by this. How great a savior do we have that where, where sin increase, grace abound more. Sometimes I think our faith fails us there. That we see what happen and what people do and we think, surely they can never be saved. How can they be saved if, look at them, they should not be forgiven. And yet, God in his grace has forgiven us and has forgiven others. Their most heinous sins against him. And so we see that at the identity of Christ, the right response is adoration. Many respond with animosity. And in the third group in this, in this narrative represents those who respond with apathy, with indifference. And they are represented by the, the chief priests and the scribes. The chief priests were those who served in the, uh, the Sanhedrin. This is the highest court to the Jews, uh, over, over, presided over by the, by, the, by the high priest, and then a number of other chief priests and elders and scribes, about 71 of them in total. And they, this is the, the, the legal, uh, the high court, really, of, 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 uh, of the Jews. And the scribes, the scribes, their role actually evolved over time from just being recorders of document and copyists of, of, of Scripture to actually being experts in the law. They were the lawyers of the day. If you, want, if you have a legal question about, they were experts in interpreting the law of Moses. And they were often were, were Pharisees. And so these religious leaders are the ones whom Herod inquired of about the birth of, of the Messiah. Now, the Magi had very little revelation. Herod had some Revelation and, and he had access to uh, these chief priests because most of them were appointed by him. And then uh, uh, the chief priests themselves, they had the fullest of revelation. They knew the most. Uh, they should have been the one who were to recognize the Messiah. Because they had the law, the prophets, and Psalms, whom Jesus said testified about him. They are the oracles of God, the word of God. And they were experts in interpreting the word. And so the, um, their, their, their knowledge was by no means complete or perfect. But they knew most about his person and his mission, Christ's person and mission. And so they promptly answered Herod, the Messiah is going to be born in, in Bethlehem. And he quotes Micah, the prophet Micah, uh, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among your leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so... Christ will come, born in Bethlehem of Judah, uh, will be the, although Judah was a, the small, the least among the leaders of Judah, and he will be a shepherd, not an oppressive leader, but one who cares and leads his people.
And so the, the arrival of the Magi, the inquiry of King Herod from them, their study of the word and their knowledge of the coming Messiah left these men cold, indifferent, unmoved, apathetic. They should have been the ones to go out searching for the Messiah. The ones who would, who would come worshipping Him. Who, who would come bowing down, bringing gifts, paying homage to Him. Announcing His arrival. Blessing His name. But the knowledge of Christ, the identity of Christ, the announcement of His birth, was not connected to faith in their hearts. It did not stir their affections and it did not move their will. And later on, as we'll see, when Jesus appeared and began his public ministry, they should have recognized him. They probably did. But their preconceived ideas of who he should be and what he should be doing caused them to reject him, to resist him, to dismiss him, to treat him with contempt, to shun him, to scorn him, and ultimately to kill him. And you see, more often than not, apathy ends up in animosity. Indifference invariably leads to indignation. And apathy towards Christ is really the sin of unbelief. It is knowing the truth and not responding appropriately to that truth. It is not rejoicing exceedingly with great joy at the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we see this really in our times, in our days in the West. This is probably one of the greatest dangers that we see, this transition where, where, where societies have known about Christ, have known about the gospel, uh, somehow built our society on the values of Christian faith and belief but it has not been connected to faith. It has not moved them. It has not stirred them. It has not caused them to adore Christ, to bow before Him and worship Him. It left them unmoved, indifferent, apathetic. And this familiarity with the identity of Jesus is beginning to breed contempt. It's beginning to grow hostility and animosity towards Him and His people. This general apathy towards Christ and the gospel is starting to turn into real animosity, tangible hostility. And so that's a danger outside of the church when we live in a, in a sort of a Christian culture. But there's also the danger of apathy within the church. The familiarity with the gospel, with the Bible, with Jesus Christ, if not properly responded to, if not acted upon, if it doesn't move you, move you to a, to a greater adoration of Christ, a greater desire to obey Him, a, a greater joy in worshiping, a greater service out of thankfulness to Him, if it doesn't do that, it will lead to apathy, to indifference. I just don't care anymore. And that has the danger of you losing your first love. Not responding to the truth, the truth of who Christ is and what he has done. Callous the heart. It hardens the heart. 
A gospel preaching, Bible teaching church is one of the most dangerous places to be. If you don't respond to the knowledge of Christ. If you know a lot, but it has not translated in me moving, worshipping, serving the Lord, it hardens your heart. It calluses your heart. And Hebrews warns us, in the day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart and provoke the Lord. But even if that is true of you today, even if you find that you have grown cold to the Lord and to his word, to the kingdom and his purposes, cold towards his people, indifferent to the lost. I just don't care whether they're saved or not. Even when that, you find yourself to be there as even in the, in the church of Ephesus and Revelations where they have done all the right things, all the right things according to the book, but they have lost their first love. If your heart is cold towards Christ this morning, indifferent to his will and his ways, there is hope. Christ said to the church in Ephesus, repent and return. Do the things you've done at first. And so if you find your heart apathetic towards the knowledge of Christ, the Savior, the King, God incarnate, then repent. Say, Lord, forgive me for, for ignoring this, for not allowing the full impact of this truth to impact my life, for not making me fall down on my face and worship you because of who you are, because of your grace and your mercy that you have shown me. Because the only right response to the revelation of, of the identity of Christ is adoration. Not animosity, not apathy. Let me pray. Father, we, we come, Lord, and we are challenged, Lord, by this. We who have maybe grown up in the church we have been reading out the scriptures faithfully for many years even, Lord. But somehow the truth has lost its effect on us. The knowledge of who Christ is have not or do not or does not impact us anymore. Our adoration has grown less joyful. So Lord, we come and we ask that you would forgive us for our apathy. Lord, for those who are even drifted into animosity in refusal to give up sin, and starting to hate those who call them to repent. Lord, forgive us, Lord, and, and help us to adore you. Because that is the only right and true response to the knowledge of the identity of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.